Good morning. morning. Can you hear me okay? Uh, Yeah, I may not look like a nice guy, but (laughs) I I am a nice guy. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God. So good morning, uh, CCMC. Um, I I call you Emily's Church. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, Blessed and honored to be here with you all on this first day of the World Week of Peace for Palestine. I bring greetings of God's grace and peace to you from Buena Vista UMC, my home church, and also from the Friends of Wadi Fokin, whose members come from several local area UMCs who have visited the village of Wadi Fokin and who have supported the villagers or have made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. It's one or one of the three or all three. I understand that there, there will be a brief presentation, as Steve mentioned, after the service about the Holy Land pilgrimage that's being planned for next spring. So please stay for that if you can. Um, if you want to learn more about the pilgrimage itself. Uh, I'm staying for that as well to help out if you have any additional questions, as well as I think Aaron is going to be there and uh, a couple other people from the Friends of Wadi Fokin. But uh, my uh, talk today is more about the scriptural reading and how it relates to the pilgrimage. As people of faith, we often refer to our faith as a journey, right? or a walk. It's a long walk, but it's a walk. And we're all on the same path. But we are at different places in that path. And uh, most of us, if not all of us, have taken detours and side trips, and we've we've been trapped in loops along this path. And, uh, And we've even gotten lost, right? Uh, but we are the the our faith tells us that we are all on the same journey, and we're guided by the same light, and we're headed toward the same destination. So we're all on this journey together. It's easy to forget, though, in the busyness of our daily lives. You know, you know about our daily lives. Just running the errands and you know commuting to and from work and even even getting ready for service and you know dealing with the traffic being stuck within in the Raiders traffic coming up this morning just for example uh, and uh, it seems like we're always moving but we're we're seeming to be standing still if you know what I mean. Like we're really busy, we're moving and doing a lot of stuff, but in a sense, we're kind of standing still. We're like, uh, so it's easy to forget that we're, we're on this journey as people of faith. So a pilgrimage, which I highly recommend, a pilgrimage is a reminder for us of the true nature of our lives as people of faith. Because a pilgrimage uh, distills into several days or a few weeks, an intentionality toward discovery and growth, a keen awareness from moment to moment and from place to place as you go along your pilgrimage of our relationship with God and being watchful for opportunities to deepen that relationship and to be alert for moments of grace. That actually happen, they happen a lot in our daily lives, but we kind of miss it because we're so caught up in things. So a pilgrimage gives you a chance to be alert to those moments. So going on a pilgrimage is not like taking a trip to Disneyland. Unless, of course, you belong to a Mickey Mouse church. <laughs> Little inside joke. Uh, so it could be, you could be superficial and distracted very easily. You see the sights, but not much else. So unless you're careful it is very easy to visit the Holy Land as if it were Disneyland. Because you could, you know, you could be busily bused from one holy site to another holy site to the next holy site, and you're stopped at these uh, souvenir shops, and you you buy the knickknacks and the Hollywood 
carvings and <coughs> and you it's it's very possible that you hardly are given a moment to pray and reflect because there's so many people and it can be very busy um, and you never get to meet the local people like people actually live there in that land and you never get to see the reality of what what has happened to that ground where Jesus walked the place where the son of god became flesh see that is kept hidden from you it can be it can be very easily kept hidden away from you behind a veil and i venture to say many if not most of holy land tours are like that having seen the buses myself and how people are rushed through them and you know like here's the church of the holy whatever and uh, here's the souvenir shop okay let's go back on the bus you know it's kind of it can be like that so fortunately there are there are uh, pilgrimages true pilgrimages that are designed to avoid that and i do believe that uh, this one that's being organized uh, through this church is not like that at all, right? So in today's scripture, the focus passage, passage from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians refers to another passage in Exodus that describes how Moses kept the veil over his face after talking with God on the mountain and whenever he was talking to the Israel, Israelites. Uh, whenever he was dealing with Israelites, because uh, and there's, there have been several interpretations of this passage, depending on the interpretation, he either did not want the Israelites to see the glow fading from his face, because apparently it started to fade, um, or the Israelites could not stand to see that glow, because it was blinding, you know, it was really bright, or it could have been both. You know, it could have been blinding and it was fading. and So there, there are basically two ways you can look at it. For Paul, though, in, the, in this passage, in this letter that he's written to the church in Corinth, the veil is an emblem, is emblematic of how what uh, some people call mosaic theology. Like when I first read the word mosaic, I thought I was thinking of the mosaics, right? <laughs> But in, uh, when, when you read enough of this like background material, uh, you learn, as I did, that mosaic is actually a reference to Moses. So, uh, in mosaic theology, the relationship with God is defined by Moses and the law. So it's a very legal uh, and kind of mosaic view of things. And for Paul, that keeps us from seeing the true glory that Christ brings. Because it keeps us from seeing the freedom that Christ gives us to pursue God's promise of what we call the beloved community. Because in the law, there is death. I mean, that's what Paul writes. He's, he's a really good writer. That's a very strong image. He says, in the law, there is death. And in Christ, there is freedom. So the veil gets in the way of our truly understanding what God wants for us, living in the freedom that Christ gives us, to live in peace, to struggle for justice, to love one another as brothers and sisters, all in this beloved community. So what we are called to consider this morning, in the next few moments of prayer and meditation, and the next few days, next few weeks, even as we go, even as we go about our lives, what we are called to answer is this question. What is the veil that keeps us from seeing what is actually happening in Palestine and doing what Christ calls us to do? So the veil, just to get us started, I just want to share a few thoughts about this veil. The veil is thick and heavy, I have to say, especially in our time and place. It's really more like a curtain, more like a blind. You know, it's like, yeah, you, you, it's very hard to see through it. So much of our culture and politics tells us to be afraid, to fear everyone and everything not al already familiar to us, not already us, ourselves. So in our case, specifically in, in our case here this morning in this church, it means that 
we're supposed to be afraid of anyone who's not Methodist or not Christian or not Chinese or not Chinese American or not Asian American or not American or not from the Bay Area or not from the West Coast or the East Coast, right? There's so much to fear if this is what you're going to, if this is what you're going to be told, there's so much you're going to be afraid of. We are told to fear Muslims and Arabs, people who have darker skin or olive skin than our own skin. There's an implicit and in, uh, increasingly in our mainstream culture, an explicit cultural assumption, a social assumption, that we are supposed to be afraid of these things. But our faith, as you all know, every Easter and every Christmas, every fa- every every Christmas and every Easter, we're reminded the main thing we're being told as Christians is, fear not. Don't be afraid. Fear not. So that's one aspect. Because we're being told these things, to be fearful. Or perhaps it's the distance. I've been gone to Palestine a couple of times, and Aaron's gone like many more times than I have. Although you come from Europe sometimes, so it's closer. But coming from here to Palestine, it's a long haul. Right, Uh, So maybe it's a distance. They seem so far away, Palestine and the rest of the Middle East. And so far away physically as well as from our everyday consciousness. And yet our faith asks us, who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? Now, I don't have enough time for a history lesson here, but it very quickly... We, the U.S., the United States, Great Britain, and the Western Allies, actually brought the Middle East to us by going over there and colonizing that region, dividing it up among themselves in the aftermath of the First World War. And we are still trying to control its people and resources for our own benefit rather than theirs, up to this day. So it's been almost a full century of colonialism in that region. So far. So, in a way, Palestine and the Middle East are not that distant because we basically went over there and brought them over here in our own consciousness. And the issues there come derived directly from our own policies, not just in government and the military, but also from churches. It's not only our government and the military, but also Christian churches that support unjust and oppressive policies of the Israeli government toward all the people in Palestine. The latest, I don't know if you heard the latest news, but last week it was announced that $38 billion over the next 10 years has been promised in military aid to the Israeli government by the U.S., which is the largest single grant of military aid that our government has given to any single country. And yet our faith tells us that our Savior is the Prince of Peace. So, something not right here. The veil has many layers. This veil has many layers. And the layer that has the most profound effect on us as Christians, I just want to alert everyone to this, is the one that we barely even notice because it's so deeply ingrained. So deeply ingrained... The, are the assumptions in our theology and scriptural interpretation. These assumptions that we've taken, mostly the Western mainstream churches uh, have taken in theology and scriptural interpretation, that the apologists for the Israeli government use these assumptions to defend and justify the worst transgressions against Palestinians of all faiths. So this layer that I'm talking about is precisely the veil that Paul is talking about in this passage. Because it's woven from a specific mosaic interpretation of the scripture. Obviously, I'm not a biblical scholar. I didn't go to PSR like a lot of people, like some people. I'm not a biblical scholar, but it's apparent even even to me as a layperson that so much of the pretext for the Israeli claim to the Holy Land is based on a specific interpretation that is legalistic, a letter of the law interpretation 
of an early covenant between God and the Hebrew people and ignore subsequent covenants that are described even in the Hebrew Scriptures. So even in the Hebrew Scriptures, there wasn't yet just that one original covenant. There were subsequent ones. Not to mention the new covenant that we are all about as Christians. The new covenant that was brokered by Jesus Christ between God and ourselves. For people of faith then, for us, you're here this morning, so you've got to have the faith. The the Palestinian question challenges us to dig more deeply into our scriptures, not relying on being retold, having these scriptures retold to us in popular culture, not allowing Hollywood to mediate our own understanding of our faith, not stopping, for example, with a book of Exodus or what I call the Synoptic Gospels Greatest Hits. You know, there are these little <laughs> stories about Jesus of it here and there. But like when, I, when I was a boy, just for example, I have to, uh, I'll just share this with you. Um, I remember a movie coming out called The Bible. You know, it was a movie from Hollywood called The Bible. And I would say, oh, The Bible. You, can, you don't have to read The Bible. Just go to this, go to this movie. So I, I saw the movie, and it was really just a, like a part of Exodus. You know, it ends, uh, I forget where, but obviously you can't really make a movie out of the Bible uh, unless unless it's a TV series or something. (laughs) But that's an example of how, for myself, my own experience, I allowed the popular culture from that young age define what I understood to be the Bible. I thought for the longest time, because, you know, I was a kid. I thought for the longest time, oh, that's the Bible and it's Exodus and that's it. So there are certain assumptions that you take if that's all you know about what the Bible is about, what our relationship with God is, and what theological basis or lack of it there might be for what is the current claim by the Israelis over the land of Palestine. So we need to understand this veil so that we can lift it from our, from our eyes and our hearts So we need to peel back the layers of fear, of distance. We need to peel back cultural assumptions, theological dogma, because we have been given the freedom by Christ to see the glory of God and to struggle for it. You know, he didn't do all that just so that, you know, I go to a movie and live in darkness for the rest of my life. You know, that's not the way to be. So, that's the veil. When I went on my first pilgrimage to the Holy Land in 2007, I went again in 2010, but in 2007, which is the first time, I was, excuse me, I was with a group of peacemakers from various faiths, uh, Christian, Muslim, Jew, Hindu, And all of us are trying to understand and respond from our respective religions to the facts on the ground, the actual conditions of Palestinian people of all faiths, and the unjust and oppressive Israeli occupation of all of Palestine. So we toured the the holy sites, of course, and uh, when we met with various people of all religions, uh, human rights groups, uh, cultural groups, peace activists, uh, military support groups, it was really quite an experience. Um, my trip in 2010 was different, uh, but I'm describing to you my first experience of it. The defining goal of the pilgrimage, of that first one I took, was to walk the Holy Land as Jesus walked it. That's, that's how it was positioned to us. And Jesus was a Palestinian Jew living under Roman occupation. So that was, that was, a, ma- that was a major uh, context for us. And as it turned out, it was very easy for me as an ethnic, racial, and religious minority to, in an occupied land, to assume that perspective. You know, I could, I could see it. And I'm not saying that it was exactly the way Jesus might have seen it, Palestinian Jew under Roman occupation. 
But for a Filipino American Christian touring the Holy Land amongst Palestinians occupied by the Israelis, I could relate. So we were given a lot of, uh, lots of materials to study and review in preparation for the trip, but nothing really prepares you or me. Nothing really prepared me for what I saw there. Partly because as a pilgrim, I had high hopes but no expectations. I would recommend that's the best way to go into pilgrimage. You have high hopes but no expectations. <laughs> and mostly because I was intentional and aware of what I was going through. I was keenly aware. And everything I saw, I keenly felt. So if you have more questions about what I'm talking about, uh, because there are too many moments I'd like to take up more time here. But there were many moments through that first pilgrimage and the second one that I went to in 2010 uh, where I saw moments of grace and just moments where I thought uh, God was there and was calling me to be there with him or her. Uh, but I just want to mention a couple of things now as a way of highlighting how that Pilgrimage changed my life as a Christian, as an American, as a person of color, and a, a, as a husband and father. Um, so I'll skip right to the end. After almost two weeks in Palestine, my first night out of Palestine, I spent in a hotel in Jordan, uh, which, if you know anything about Jordan, is not the most free or the most democratic place in the world. But Compared to what I had just seen in Palestine, it was like a breath, it was like a breath of fresh air. Uh, it did not seem so grossly wrong and indecent to be in Jordan compared to how it felt to be in Palestine under Israeli occupation. And that place gave me a moment to let the experience sink in that night. And it wasn't a pretty sight. I'll just confess to you that in the, Catholic, in the Catholic tradition, I don't know if any of you are former Catholics, but in the Catholic tradition, there is the idea of the dark night of the soul. I don't know if you've heard that expression. Um, and that first night out in 2007, my first night out of Palestine, for me, was one of my darkest nights. One of the darkest nights of my soul, I guess. And mostly because I realized for the first time how as a person of faith, as a Christian, I had failed Jesus so completely. I felt so inadequate. I had failed Jesus so miserably. And mostly it was, a lot of it was the, 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 grievous, the, the grief of realizing the irony that on the very land that we call holy because our Savior walked there. Uh, because uh, that land where he became one of us, you know, he became flesh, he became one of us there and, and taught us and showed us the way there. On that very land, I had just witnessed the grossest, most systematic, officially sanctioned transgressions against God's children. And I was part of it. As an American, as a Christian, I was part of it. I helped enable it. So that was a tough night. As you can tell, even now describing it to you, I'm having a tough time. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, and I don't want to discourage anyone from taking the pilgrimage, but I want you to know, with well, eyes wide open, that uh, there's something else that happened to me that I call the burden of knowing. Now, not everybody assumes this burden when you go to the Holy Land, when you take this pilgrimage. I'm sure lots of people go on their Disneyland tours of the Holy Land, and maybe they don't get this burden. But what I want to, what I want to describe is the, the burden of knowing. Uh, I, I, I basically assumed that burden since 2007. And my wife and my daughter, who went together in 2013, uh, they also have this burden now. So I, I just want to tell you what it's like. Uh, it's a burden because once you know, once you understand what is going on there and how it relates to you as a person of faith and as a citizen of the United States, 
and of this world, then you cannot be casual about your faith anymore. There's no easy way to... I can't sugarcoat it for you, right? You can't be casual. You're going to get serious. It's going to mean something. Your faith is going to mean something to you. You cannot coast on your responsibilities of citizenship as an American citizen, as a citizen of the world. And every now and then, you cannot help but feel a deep, deep sadness for how your church has failed to listen to its Savior. We have failed in so many ways, it's sad. And how your country has failed the world. Now and then, it just hits you. It hits me. I see my daughter. I, my, my wife's talking at another church. My wife's, my daughter's talking at another church. And when I've seen them do that, when I've seen my, my daughter's at 20, and of course... To anyone who's a dad, your daughter's always that kid, right? <laughs> so to see your daughter at 20 years old share this grief, it's really something. So you, you, you're going to know this. And I think, though, it's always better to know than not to know. It's always better to deepen your faith than to be shallow about it. It's always better to mean it than to be casual, right? So I hope some of you are able to go to this pilgrimage and that all of you, if you're unable to go, the ones who don't go, I really pray that you are able to follow your pilgrims from afar, you know, from here, and get to know God better through them. So thank you for listening. And may God's peace be with us all.